It is my sincerest pleasure to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker, William Julius Wilson. Um, and I have to say that it is a major coup that we actually scored him today, and it's my pleasure um, to introduce him. Um, William Julius Wilson is Lewis P. and Linda L. Geyser University professor at Harvard University. Um, that makes him only one of 25 university professors at Harvard, which is the highest professional distinction for a Harvard faculty member. Um, his resume is quite extensive. Um, I'll only note a few highlights. Um, Wilson has received 45 honorary degrees, making him having more than uh, 45 more honorary degrees than I presently hold. Um, and these include honorary degrees from Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Penn, Northwestern, Johns Hopkins, Dartmouth, and the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He is an official genius, um, having received the MacArthur Prize Fellow um, from 1987 to 1992. Um, he's written several, several books, um, including The Declining Significance of Race, um, The Truly Disadvantaged, and if I can uh, insert an autobiographical note here, this was my introduction um, to William Julius Wilson's work. Um, I was a wee little lass, a freshman a sociology major at Spelman when we read his book, The Truly Disadvantaged, and all sorts of lights started turning on and made me think that I wanted to, to study race. Um, I should also note that his entire body of work can be purchased um, a brisk, invigorating walk down the street um, at Barnes & Nobles in um, Kenmore Square. Um, I should also note that the holidays are approaching and these make fun um, stocking stuffers. Um, <laughs> young and poor, uh, young and um, old alike. Um, he's received more awards than I can count. Um, he has sat on every board that has ever existed. It's a slight exaggeration. Um, without further ado, um, giving uh, today's keynote titled Public Policy Challenges Facing the Growing Shift in Emphasis from Race-Based to Class-Based Programs, William Julius Wilson. Well, I must say that I'm pleased uh, to have the opportunity to address this august body. Uh, my comments today will be somewhat uh, provocative, but they are designed to uh, stimulate uh, discussion, even if you disagree with much of what I have to say. Uh, and propose. Uh, so let me begin. In the latter uh, 1960s and early 1970s, several black intellectuals wrote insightful articles that raised questions about the direction and goals of the civil rights movement. They made it clear that from 1965, 1955 to 1965, the chief objectives of the civil rights movement were to integrate public accommodations and eliminate black disfranchisement. These were matters of constitutional rights and basic dignity matters that affected African Americans and other people of color exclusively and therefore could be addressed simply as problems of civil rights. However, these authors, also, these authors noted that despite the uh, spectacular victories in the area of civil rights, by the latter half of the 1960s, a more complex and fundamental set of problems had yet to be attacked. Problems of jobs, education, and housing that affected all racial groups in the United States, not just African Americans. A consistent theme running throughout these articles was that in the period from 1955 to the early uh, 1960s, all blacks, regardless of their station in life, were concerned about the banning of discrimination in public accommodations and in voting. As the late Bayard Rustin put it, quote, Ralph Bunch, 
was as likely to be refused restaurant to be to be refused service in a restaurant or a hotel as any illiterate sharecropper. This common bond prevented the latent class differences and resentments from being openly expressed." Unquote. However, the group that had profited the most from civil rights legislation up to 1965 were middle class blacks. Those who had competitive resources, such as steady incomes, education, and special talents. As a late black scholar, Kenneth B. Clark, argued in 1967, quote, the masses of Negroes are now starkly aware of the fact that recent civil rights victories benefited a very small percentage of middle class Negroes, while their predicament remained the same or worsened, unquote. Now what these intellectuals were telling us was that a close examination of ghetto black discontent, most dramatically reflected in the riots of the 1960s, revealed issues that transcended the creation and implementation of civil rights laws. Quote, to the segregation by race, Bayard Rustin argued in 1971, was now added segregation by class and all the problems created by segregation and poverty, inadequate schooling, substandard and overcrowded housing, lack of access to jobs and job training, narcotics and crime, were greatly aggravated." Unquote. The late Martin Luther King Jr. recognized this point in 1968, when shortly before his death he asked, quote, what good is it to be allowed to eat in a restaurant if you can't afford a hamburger, unquote. It would probably, it would not be unfair to suggest that he was probably influenced by the thoughts of Bayard Rustin, who four years earlier in his influential article from protest to politics, phrased the matter in a similar way. Quote, what is the value of winning access to public accommodations for those who lack money to use them, unquote. Thus, these perceptive civil rights advocates recognized that removing artificial racial barriers would not enable poor blacks to compete equally with other groups in society for valued resources because of an accumulation of disadvantages flowing from previous periods of prejudice and discrimination. Basic changes in our modern industrial economy have compounded the problems of poor blacks because education and training have become more important for entry into the more desirable and higher paying jobs and because increased reliance on labor saving devices has contributed to a surplus of untrained black workers. In short, once the movement faced these more fundamental issues, argued Rustin in 1965, quote, it was compelled to expand its vision beyond race relations to economic relations, including the role of education in society. However, arguments stressing economic relations in determining the structure of inequality began to compete with a new definition, description, and explanation of the black condition. This new approach pro pro proclaimed as a black perspective revealed an ideological shift from interracialism to racial solidarity. It first gained currency among militant black spokespersons in the late 1960s and became a theme in the writings of a number of black academics and intellectuals by the early 1970s. 
Although the black perspective represented a variety of views and arguments on issues of race, the trumpeting of racial pride and self-affirmation were common to all the writings and speeches on the subject. Thus, interracial cooperation and integration were being challenged by the ideology of racial solidarity and a rhetoric of black militancy symbolized by the cry of black power gradually moved from expressions of selective to generalized hostility toward whites. Consistent with the dominant focus on racial solidarity in the late 60s and early 70s was an emphasis on we versus they, black versus white. Since the accent was on race, little attention was paid to the socioeconomic differences within the black community and the implications they had for public policy options, and little discussion was devoted to problems with the economy and the need for economic reform. Thus, the promising move in the latter 1960s that Rustin and these people were talking about to pursue programs of economic reform by defining the problems of American economic organization and outlining their efforts on people, their, their, their outlining their effect on people and communities of color was offset by slogans calling for reparations or black control of institutions serving the black community. And this is why my Harvard colleague Orlando Patterson was led to proclaim in a later analysis that black ethnicity had become, quote, a form of mystification, diverting attention from the correct kinds of solutions to the terrible economic conditions of the group, unquote, thereby making it difficult for blacks to see the inextricable connection between their own fate and the structure of the modern American economy. Meanwhile, during this period of racial solidarity, significant events were unfolding in inner city communities across the nation that profoundly affected the lives of millions of blacks and dramatically revealed that the problems earlier described by observers such as Kenneth Clark and Bayard Rustin had reached catastrophic proportions. And nowhere is this more clearly seen than in, in many inner city black ghettos that had experienced significant depopulation since 1970. This pattern represents an important change in the formation of neighborhoods. In the earlier years, communities undergoing racial change from white to black tended to experience an increase in population density as a result of the black migration from the south. Because of the housing demand, particularly in the late stages of the succession from white to black, homes and apartments in these neighborhoods were often subdivided into smaller units. However, 1970, marked the end of the great migration wave of blacks from the south to northern urban areas, and several developments affected the course of population movement into and out of the inner cities after that time. Improvements in transportation made it easier for workers to live outside the central city, and industries gradually shifted to the suburbs because of the increased residential suburbanization of the labor force and the lower cost of production. Thus, central city manufacturing jobs were no longer a strong factor pulling southern migrants to central cities. 
So with the decline of industrial employment in the inner city, the influx of southern black migrants to northern city ceased, and many poor black neighborhoods, especially those in the Midwest and Northeast, changed from densely packed areas of recently arrived migrants to communities gradually abandoned by the working and middle classes who had increased their efforts to move from concentrated black poverty areas to more desirable neighborhoods throughout the metropolitan area. With the departure of higher income families, the least upwardly mobile in society are left behind in neighborhoods with high concentrations of poverty and deteriorating physical conditions. And these neighborhoods offer few jobs and tip typically lack basic services and amen amenities such as banks, grocery stores, and other retail establishments, parks, and quality transit. Two of the most visible indicators of neighborhood decline are abandoned buildings and vacant lots. According to one recent report, there are 60 abandoned and buildings and vacant properties in Philadelphia, 40,000 in Detroit, and 26,000 in Baltimore. If any of you have ever watched HBO's The Wire, W-I-R-E, Simon brilliantly captures this dynamic of neighborhood change. The increasing and prolonged joblessness, the declining proportion of non-poor families, and the overall depopulation have made it more difficult to sustain basic institutions or to achieve adequate levels of social organization in these neighborhoods. Indeed, all of the changes, all of these changes have had a profound effect on the social organization of these neighborhoods, resulting in a weak institutional resource base. You see, it is easier for parents to control the behavior of the children in their neighborhoods when a strong institutional resource base exists and when the links between community institutions, such as churches, schools, political organizations, businesses, and civic clubs are strong or secure. The higher the density and stability of formal organizations, the less illicit activities such as drug trafficking, crime, prostitution, and the formation of gangs can take root in the neighborhood. To repeat, a weak institutional resource base is what distinguishes high jobless inner city neighborhoods from stable middle class and working class areas. Parents in high jobless neighborhoods have a much more difficult task of controlling the behavior of their adolescents are preventing them from getting involved in activities detrimental to pro-social development. And given the lack of organizational capacity and a weak institutional resource base in these neighborhoods, some parents choose to protect their children by isolating them from activities in the neighborhoods, including the avoidance of contact and interaction with neighborhood families, and whenever possible, and often with great difficulty when one considers the problems of transportation and limited financial resources, they attempt to establish contacts and cultivate relations with individuals, families, and institutions outside the neighborhood, such as church groups, schools, and community recreation programs. But I must say that it's just as indefensible to treat inner city residents as superheroes who overcome chronic racial and economic subordination as it is to view them as helpless victims. We should, however, create, appreciate the restricted range of choices that are available to inner city families and residents in these jobless neighborhoods because they live under constraints and they face challenges that most people in the larger society do not experience or can't even imagine. Now, by 1980, it was clear that many American citizens, including civil rights supporters, 
were puzzled by deteriorating conditions in poor black neighborhoods. Despite the passage of anti-discrimination legislation and the creation of affirmative action programs, they sensed that conditions were getting worse, not better, for a significant segment of African Americans. This perception had emerged because of the constant flow of pessimistic reports concerning the sharp rise in black unemployment, the substantial decline of blacks in the labor force, the consistent increase in the percentage of blacks on the welfare rolls, the remarkable growth of poor single parent households, and the persistent problems of black crime and black victims of crime. The perception was reinforced by the almost uniform cry among black leaders that conditions were deteriorating and that white Americans had abandoned the cause of blacks as well. In the face of these developments, there were notable, noticeable signs. Even before Ronald Reagan was elected president and well before his administration adopted a conspicuously laissez-faire attitude towards civil rights. There were signs that demoralization had set in among many blacks who had come to believe that nothing really works and among many whites who were otherwise committed to social reform. Unfortunately, these proponents of racial equality fail to appreciate that many contemporary problems in the African American community cannot be satisfactorily, satisfactorily addressed solely by race specific programs to eliminate racial discrimination and eradicate racial prejudices. But what about the war on poverty? Weren't the programs that emanated from it designed to confront problems of poverty that plagued blacks and other disadvantaged groups? The war on poverty emerged paradoxically during an era of general economic prosperity. In the early 1960s, a budget surplus existed, and economists optimistic about continued economic growth predict predicted that this surplus would continue to rise throughout the latter half of the decade. Federal revenues were growing so rapidly that many economists, not foreseeing the Vietnam War buildup, were concerned that if new expenditures could not be generated to reduce the growing tax surplus, it would ultimately slow economic growth. So despite high levels of unemployment in the inner city and in other low-income areas, it was not difficult for key advisors in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations to see minority poverty as a problem unrelated to the national economy. When the United States started to face the problems associated with the concentration of people of color in large urban ghettos, the Council of Economic Advisors discussed these problems not within the realm of economic concerns, but as marginal issues of poverty. Accordingly, increasing black joblessness was viewed as a problem of poverty and discrimination, not of American economic organization, and therefore could be addressed by anti-poverty measures, such as compensatory job training and anti-discrimination legislation. In the succinct words of one observer, quote, the main impetus of great society po policy, therefore, was to give the disadvantaged the income and skills they needed to function in the free market, not change the economic rules in their favor, unquote. However, changes in the structure of employment since 1960 have seriously diminished the earnings and job stability of many workers. 
of many working Americans whose skills have not kept pace with the shifting requirements of the labor market. The Great Recession, which officially lasted from December 2007 through June 2009, magnified this problem. Sociologist Arnie Kallenberg argues convincingly that industry restructuring, globalization, deregulation, and the decline in unionization are causing the dramatic increase in unstable lower wage jobs and concomitant decline in relatively low skilled traditional middle class jobs with good pay and benefits, job stability and steady promotions. Workers from all racial and ethnic backgrounds who hold jobs in the most vulnerable occupational sectors have been affected. They face working reduced hours, taking a lower paid position, or leaving the workforce permanently. And this is particularly true for black and Latino workers, especially from disadvantaged backgrounds who must contend with other unique circumstances that seriously curtail their ability to compete for good jobs. For example, historical patterns of occupational clustering in manufacturing and low paying service jobs have disproportionately exposed them to unstable employment during economic downturns. When a national unemployment average hit double digits in October 2009, for the first time in more than a quarter century, it was major news. But unemployment among black men had already been in the double digits for most of the last several decades. Unemployment rates also topped 10% among Latino men during the Great Recession, but not among white males. Unemployment rates do not reveal the full extent of the job crisis affecting low-income African, low-income Americans. Now this figure shows the combined rates of unemployment and involuntary part-time employment among males by racial and ethnic group. And I should point out that uh, involuntary part-time workers are those who work who would like to work a 40 hour per week job, but have had their hours curtailed or, un, or are unable to find full-time employment. Now, as the data indicate, economic cycles, particularly the deep recessions that the United States experienced recently and in the early 1980s, seen in the parallel gray bars, affected rates of unemployment and underemployment among black and Latino males much more severely than among their white counterparts. And the differences would have been even more severe if employment to population ratios had been used in these calculations, which capture those who have dropped out of the labor force and are therefore not included in the official unemployment rates. My colleagues and I are going to come up with a new graph that includes uh, these figures in the article we're working on. Minority workers who face barriers to employment and are concentrated in specific sectors of the economy are handicapped when economic downturns or shifts in the labor market diminish employment opportunities in those sectors. Now this figure illustrates, based on fairly broad categories, how the occupational clustering of black and Latino male workers, as compared with white workers, has progressed for more than a quarter century. And I just want to focus on blacks here you see that if you look at the, the, the blue bars, upper right hand corner there of the top draft graph, 
Blacks are heavily concentrated in manufacturing the dark area, the dark blue area in the top right graph. The uh, civil rights reforms and job creation efforts in the 1960s and early 1970s open up better employment opportunities and help to boost their economic progress after decades of widespread discrimination. And many of these gains came in manufacturing and goods producing industries where black workers were already well represented. But the gains were fragile. And middle skill blue collar jobs, those that the economists David Otter and Frank Levy of MIT and Richard Murname of Harvard described as being acquired through routinized on the job experience, were increasingly relocated offshore or to less industrial areas of the country or were replaced by production, by by production enhancing technology. The restructuring of the US labor force provided fewer opportunities for on the job skills acquisition and pushed less educated minority workers down the earnings ladder distribution in those very sectors in which their predecessors had made inroads decades before. in this connection. Given the most comprehensive civil rights legislation and the most comprehensive anti-poverty program in the nation's history, in the 1970s and early 1980s, it was difficult for liberals who had adopted either the race relations vision in addressing the problems of people of color or the vision of the war on poverty, it was difficult for them to provide a convincing critique of the conservative argument that the sharp increases in concentrated poverty, joblessness, and welfare receipt among poor blacks were due to individual or group deficiencies. And by the early 1980s, these liberals were on the defensive. This is what motivated me to write my book, The Truly Disadvantaged. They were on the defensive, and their position made it easy for conservative policy analysts such as Charles Murray and his widely read 1984 book, Losing Ground, to argue that liberal programs have been ineffective and misdirected, and that emphasis should be placed on forcing value and behavior changes, particularly among ghetto residents. Just as the architects of the war on poverty failed to relate the problems of the poor to the broader processes of American economic organization, so too had the advocates for minority rights failed in significant numbers to understand that many contemporary problems of race, especially those that engulf poor people of color, emanate from the broader problems of economic organization and therefore cannot be satisfactorily addressed mainly by race-specific programs. What was lacking then and is still lacking today is a comprehensive and integrative framework, in other words, a holistic approach that shows how contemporary racial problems in America are often part of a more general or complex set of problems whose origins and or development may have little or no direct connection with race. The curious paradox is that whereas economic transformation since World War II enabled many blacks to experience occupational mobility, recent structural shifts in the economy have diminished mobility opportunities for others. And whereas anti-discrimination legislation has removed many racial barriers, not all blacks had 
have been in a position to benefit from this change. Indeed, the position of poor blacks actually deteriorated during the very period in which the most sweeping anti-discrimination legislation, legislation and programs had been enacted and implemented. The net effect is a growing economic schism between poor and higher income blacks. Accordingly, policies that do not take into account the changing nature of the national economy will not effectively handle the economic dislocation of low income people of color. Factors that must be considered are the economy's rate of growth and the nature of its variable demand for labor, matters that affect employment and different occupational sectors, such as profit rates, technology, and unionization, and patterns of institutional and individual migration that are a result of economic transformations and shifts. In the opening parts of my lecture, I pointed out that perceptive civil rights advocates recognized in the 1960s that removing artificial racial barriers would not enable poor African Americans to compete equally with other groups in society for valuable resources because of an accumulation of disadvantages flowing from previous periods of prejudice and discrimination, disadvantages that have been passed on from generation to generation. To repeat, basic structural changes in our modern economy have compounded the problems of poor blacks because education and training have become more important for entry into the more desirable and higher paying jobs. And because increased reliance on labor saving devices have aggravated the conditions of untrained black workers. In short, once the civil rights movement faced these more fundamental issues, argued Bayard Rustin as far back as 1965, quote, it was compelled to expand its vision beyond race relations to economic relations, unquote. So the purpose of my lecture today was to revisit Rustin's arguments and critically examine their application in the 21st century, as well as their public policy implications. I advance four main arguments. One, the vulnerability of poor urban minorities to changes in the economy since 1970 has resulted in sharp increases in joblessness and concentrated poverty, despite anti-discrimination and affirmative action programs. Two, the war on poverty and race relations vision failed to relate the fate of poor people of color to the functionings of the modern American economy and therefore could not adequately explain the worsening conditions of inner city minorities in the post great society and post civil rights periods. Three, liberals whose view embody these visions had not only been puzzled by the recent increase of inner city social dislocations they also lacked a convincing rebuttal to the forceful argument advanced by conservative scholars that erroneously attributed these problems to the culture of the ghetto poor. And four, the growing emphasis of the cultural values of the poor deflects attention from the major source of inner city dislocation since 1970, I underline the word since, that is changes in the economy. Let me now conclude with a brief discussion of the public policy implications of my analysis. Any significant reduction of the problems of black poverty and related problems of crime and family breakups will call for a far more comprehensive program of economic and social reform than what Americans have usually regarded as appropriate or desirable. In short, it will require a radicalism that neither Democrat, Democratic nor Republican parties have as yet been realistic or dedicated enough. 
to propose. I'm talking specifically about the creation of a macroeconomic policy designed to promote both economic growth and a tight labor market. The latter tight labor markets affect the supply and demand ratio and wages tend to rise. It would be necessary, however, to combine, combine this policy with fiscal and monetary policies to stimulate non-inflationary growth and thereby move away from the policy of controlling inflation by allowing unemployment to rise. I am also talking about a national labor market strategy to make the labor force, including the black labor force, more adaptable to changing economic opportunities. This would include on-the-job training and apprenticeships to elevate the skills of these workers. Since national opinion polls consistently reveal strong public support for a program of economic reform, macroeconomic employment policies and labor market strategies, including training efforts, could receive considerably stronger public support than many people presently assume. Finally, the question of child care has to be addressed. In any program designed to improve the employment prospects of women and men, because of high participation of women in the labor market, adequate child care has been a topic receiving attention in public policy discussions. For the overwhelming single parent poor families, access to quality child care becomes a critical issue when steps are taken to move single mothers into education and training programs and or full or part-time employment. However, I'm not recommending government-operated child care centers. Rather, it would be better to avoid additional federal bureaucracy by seeking alternative and decentralized forms of child care, such as expanding the child tax credit, including three and four-year-olds in preschool enrollment, and providing child care subsidies to working poor families. I end by saying that I suggest these comprehensive policies with few illusions, few illusions that they are feasible in the current political climate. But it is important to think seriously about the kinds of projects we should discuss when a more favorable political in, uh, environment does eventually emerge. And I maintain that these comprehensive measures should be a central part of that discussion. Thank you. Wilson for those remarks. We actually have time for a couple of questions. Um, there will be microphones circulating and we have a question up in front. So if you just raise your hand, um, we'll get a microphone to you. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful remarks. I wanted to say, you know, they resonate with me, especially some things that Leah Sears, um, you may know, has written about uh, the marriage gap, which we heard about this morning. And it's especially intriguing that next year is the 50th anniversary of the Moynihan Report. And I thought uh, the insight of your comments is that we have to put fathers back in a position of being able to support families and to be integral in that. Um, so I just wanted to, to commend you on uh, the insight that we have to do better in allowing families to function together as families. You know, you, you mentioned the, the, the Moynihan uh, report. A lot of people have uh, critiqued that report without reading it carefully. But one of the things that he was concerned about was some of these basic economic changes that I mentioned. And he related these economic changes to the plight of uh, black males in the labor market. Um, yeah, I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the need to focus on black women, too, so that's why I made sure that I included that last section there on child care. Right. Um, 
Um, thank you, Professor Wilson, for your really interesting comments. And you really get to the core, I think, of the major problems we're having today. I'm interested in your thoughts on the um, the how the drug war fits into your your suggestions. Um, I think that if we take the steps to increase minimum wage, for example, that it might not get us as far as we want to go because there's this other economic opportunity out there with the illegality of drugs, and I'm wondering how that fits into your suggested. So proposal. it's not only increasing uh, minimum wage; it's providing jobs for these people particularly the uh, young people in inner city neighborhoods who can't find employment. And so they turn to, uh, they, they get involved in the drug industry. Um, and if I had more time, I would, when I talked about the problems of the social organization and neighborhoods in these jobless neighborhoods, you see, it's important to realize that a neighborhood in which people are poor and jobless is significantly different from a neighborhood in which people are poor and working. You see, a lot of these inner city neighborhoods in previous years, people were employed. Once joblessness increased, then the drug trafficking took over because people couldn't find jobs. And, and the, 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 the drug lord just destroyed these, uh, destroyed these neighborhoods. So that would be a basic part of any program would be to address the problems of drug trafficking, but I would maintain that what's feeding drug trafficking is joblessness. And we can improve the, the employment conditions in these neighborhoods, particularly uh, improving, for example, school to work transition. So that when these kids, kids can see a connection between graduating from high school and post-school employment, because right now they see even some of the kids who are graduating from high school are hanging around out, out on the corners. You know, if you look at the, some of the recent data, the percentage of blacks who don't go on to college and who, who graduate from high school, the percentage of them who are jobless the following October after they, after they graduate in June is really, it's huge. I mean, a substantial majority of them are, are not working and they get involved in, in, in the drug trade as a result, looking for some, some kind of employment. This is a, a question I think that in some ways build, builds on the last, and you may have already answered it, but I, I, I was uh, eager to hear your analysis of where the massive growth of the American criminal justice system and the racial disparities within it over much of the same period of your story fits into the analysis. And do you see that as simply a consequence of economic equality, or do you see it also as a, a driver of some of the problems that you're Both discussing? Both a consequence and a driver. Um, again, if I'd had more time, I would have uh, built in um, some of my thinking about the role of the criminal justice system and how a lot of the problems that we talk about have been aggravated by problems in the criminal justice system, increasing incarceration of these young men. Um, a majority, I wish I had the figures in my head, but a fairly significant majority of black high school graduates, or I should say black high school dropouts, end up in prison. And then what happens to these young men when they return to the community? Well, they're stigmatized. They can't find work. And then they get involved in, in the drug trafficking as well as overall crime. I mentioned this show, HBO's The Wire. I was just curious how many of you have watched that program. Well, if you haven't seen it, go buy the DVDs. If you're interested in these problems, it's a brilliant show. HBO's The Wire, W-I-R-E, uh, okay, so you make, sure you make sure you get it. By the way, I don't have time to, you know, I have, I have time just to make, say, one. So my book, When Work Disappears, uh, I found out that David Simon had read it, and it influenced the framing of seasons one, two, and three. <laughs> And when David Simon told me that, I was walking around the Harvard campus with a swagger. <laughs>
Thank you very much.